talking about the Human Brain Project, which I think a lot of us will have heard about, uh, specifically about the Human Brain Atlas. So thank you very much. Uh, I give it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, so my name is Liu Batil. I'm, thank you. I'm uh, working for the uh, Human Brain Project since 2017, and I'm actually working in the team of the curation. So I'm collecting all human data and monkey data within the HPP, curate them, check them for quality, and integrate their metadata into uh, the database we're setting up, which is called the Knowledge Graph, and there's going to be a talk in the afternoon about this by Oliver Schmidt. Um, Myself, I'm not an expert on the Human Brain Atlas, but I'm working closely together with all the people involved, and it's not the first time I have a talk on this, but uh, if you have detailed technical questions, stay with me. I'm not sure if I can answer them, but I can point you in the right direction. Um, yes, so I, I'm just gonna start. So the Human Brain Atlas, I'm not sure what your background is, but we will start very simple. So what is a brain atlas in general? So what is the concept behind it? And speaking of concept, I wanted to point out that I'm doing a lot of concept development. So the whole architecture behind the database, for example, the metadata behind it, that's like the development that I do together with some colleagues. Um, so if you have questions on that, in the end, we can, we can maybe have a short excursion on that. So, but what is a brain atlas? And in general, we can say, well, a brain atlas, of course, has to have a space. So we need to determine the coordinate space. And we can do this for the Earth, of course, but we can also do that for the brain. Then the second thing an atlas has to have is a map, right? So there needs to be something delineated um, onto our space. And these delineation of parcels in the space, can we do that in, on the Earth, of course, but we can also do that on the brain. The last thing is we have to name and define what we actually delineated before, right? We have to give it a name, we have to give it a definition, and we have to give it a relation. And this terminology, it's a bit weird to get this terminology, um, can of course be done for, again, countries on the earth, but also for brain. And I mean, here you might know if you're coming from an anatomy background that there is a lot of discussion and uh, arguments about how to name things, what is equal in namings and so on. So that's also a thing I'm, I'm working on a bit. Um, so these three things need to be in place. Now the question is, can we have one space and different maps or different atlases in one space? And of course we can, so if we take the earth, we can already imagine that we can have countries, or for the brain, we could have psychoarchitectonic areas um, delineated. Um, but we can also do it on geographical features for the Earth, and we can do it on fiber bundles for the, for the brain. Um, so of course, we can have different atlases in one space. And this is a bit what the HPP atlases are about. So we are providing a supported set of spaces and then combining different atlases in the same spaces in order to make relations between them. Um, so the next thing would be then what is actually HPP providing? So I mean, brain atlases are around for a long time, but what is the HPP human brain atlases about? So which spaces do we support? So currently we're supporting three spaces in particular. So this is the MNI Colin 27. Um, we are, and this is an important thing, we're supporting the original version, the one from 98, that comes more into place for the MNI 152, so for the next one. So we have a resolution of one millimeter here. Um, it's an average MRI template of one human male, that, like a young male, um, uh, who was recorded several times, and then the average brain was used as a template. Um, the publication is from 89, that's where the version comes from. So then we are supporting the MNI ICBM 152, but particular, that version. So there are nine versions out there uh, of the MNI ICBM 152, and as a data curator, I can say, if people are providing me data and I ask in which space do you provide it, and they say MNI 152, I'm a bit puzzled. <laughs> so um, versions are important. Um, not so much if you don't care about details but uh, for the MNI, but um, in that case. 
average MRI template of 152 humans. Um, the original publication was in 20, uh, 2009, and then there was an update in 2011 again. And as you can see already for these, uh, these spaces, so these are taken out of the atlas viewer actually, so the colon has much more defined um, uh, Zulki than the, than the average brain across 152 humans, which of course comes from the intersubject variability. So these are like quality differences in the spaces. And then we have a very special thing in the HPP. We have the big brain space supported. That's a joint project between the McGill Institute in Canada and the research center Jülich, where I'm located also. Um, the, we are currently working with the version of 2015. There are some others in the going. And this is a full brain reconstruction at 20 micrometer resolution. That's the most highest resoluted brain you can get right now. Um, it's from one human male, which was 65 years old, um, and the original publication comes from Amun Zedal. Um, currently, they're working to get this brain scanned at a one micrometer resolution. So um, just so you know, this allows for full cell reconstruction across the whole brain, which is pretty amazing. And uh, the group I'm working in at the moment, they're also actually developing algorithms and um, software in order to do so because, of course, you can imagine that this is a lot of data and it's not so easy to deal with that. We come to that back again. Um, so short excursion, uh, making of the big brain. Um, so the big brain, these are the facts I already stated, but the overall size at the moment of the 20 micrometer scans is around uh, one terabyte. Um, so it's a lot of data, and it's located at a server in Canada. Um, the method overview of how this was reproduced is a very rough one. It's not detailed, but um, so the brain was first embedded in paraffin. Then it was completely and serially cut in 20 micrometer thick slices. Um, you can imagine that considering the size of a human brain, that's quite difficult to accomplish a high quality cutting of that uh, thinness, is this a word? Thinness. So we ended up with a total number of brain slices of 7,400. Um, and all these slices then were stained for cell bodies. And all the slices were then digitized and reconstructed to a 3D brain simulation. So here you see a rough reconstruction of these slices. Um, and you end up with um, yeah, a 3D brain model. Uh, which you can actually also slice in oblique way. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's in the digitized version, you can um, do any slicing uh, direction you want to and end up with this 20 micrometer and a bit plus um, uh, resolution. So the big brain now, what it means in sense of it's out there and you can use it. So because we have this, this high resolution, we can, of course, look at differences in cytoarchitectonic compositions um, because they are visible. So here there's one example we have. Um, it's a visual cortex. Uh, some of you might recognize it. No. But, uh, but there is differences in the layer structure between V1 and V2. And you see that here quite nicely, right? So you have this, uh, this part in the V2, and then it it's dissolving, and this is the border actually between V1 and V2 in that uh, GURI. Um, the other one that you can see, I mean, you see here also large dots, uh, black dots. These are larger cells, um, and the larger cells are also nicely detectable in the motor cortex, where there are the BAT cells, which are connecting directly to the spinal cord, and they're huge cells, um, so they're easily spotted in the big brain. Um, so that's quite nice, but then you can, of course, do study with this because you have this information out there. And these studies are currently taking place. So I just took two of them. Um, one includes actually cytoarchitectonic maps. So people are sitting down and making exactly these border decisions. But if you now see that we have 7,400 slices, you don't want to do that in every slice manually, right? So that, that, that's going to be annoying and taking a lot of time or a lot of PhD students or masters. Um, so um, people came up with a better approach. So they only did for the V1 and V2, they only um, uh, did 
did manual delineations in 1% of the brain slices that's roughly as, um, uh, contained V2 and V1. And then 99% of the brain slices were actually delineated by a deep learning algorithm also developed in my group by Timo Dickscheid and colleagues. Um, currently published as a data set are those two areas. They're fully mapped with the algorithm and the according expert slices are also available. Um, and there are like, I think 10 in the making at the moment, 10 further areas. Um, so f later on we will have a look, if you have your laptop or tablets with you, we can have a look at the, at the atlases. And you will find actually more areas in the big brain. Those are only like simple interpolations between the 1% um, delineated expert slices, so they are not fully mapped by the uh, sophisticated algorithm. But yeah, so let's continue. There is another publication from Rextile et al who segmented across the whole big brain, the cortical layers. Um, and that, of course, now enables to do specific analysis of um, layer-specific features across the whole brain, which is also nice. And it allows, for example, for cell density measurements in, in the layers or for cortical thickness. And now you can imagine if you combine those two studies, you can actually do that specifically for certain areas. So that's nice, that was the short excursion on the, on the big brain. Let's get back to the general atlases thing. So which atlases do we actually support? So one I already mentioned, which is in the development, which is the big brain parcellations, but there are two others. So we have the U-brain atlas. This is also developed in Jülich by Katrin Amunds, and it's a probabilistic um, cytoarchitectonic, um, it's based on probabilistic cytoarchitectonic maps. It's at macroscopic scale, so in principle, it's the same method, we come back to this in a minute, um, as the big brain, a little less in detail, but then it's back transferred to an MRI space. And um, this is giving it back this one millimeter resolution. Um, so we are at the macroscopic scale here. We're having this um, 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 transposed into the MNI colon 27 as well as the MNI ICBM 152 from the version I mentioned before. Um, and there are two versions out there because it's also an atlas in development, so it's not a fully mapped brain yet, but um, we are currently um, increasing the number of areas like sequentially, and every time there is new data coming out, the data are published first and the paper comes later. So that's the current Idea. Yeah, oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt because I think we have a bit of time. I didn't plan for a 15 minutes talk. I um, w w the big brain is from the 65, yeah. Yeah, so it's... Ah, no, so these are separately standing. So these are three different spaces. They are not registered to each other. That's gonna happen in sense of people want to translate from one to the other, but, um, and the um, 152 is 18 to, I think, 43. Um, so the big brain itself, of course, is a bit old, and that, that, that's, that's the challenge, but these are organ donors, so normally they are relatively old. It's rather rare that we get below 40. Um, it's always a question of if you can immediately translate it, especially for cell densities and so on. So you need to keep that in mind, but that's like getting to my regime in sense of if you provide these data, of course you have to provide the metadata with it, right? So that you're aware of where you are, what you're looking at, and if you can compare it actually to something. If you have an 18-old male for yourself, like at, you, know, you need to be careful in comparing it to the 65-year-old, of course. Um, we get back to that a bit later, okay? Um, so the next one we're currently, or we currently have integrated is the fiber bundle atlas that's um, developed by Jean-Francois Magin. Um, he developed a probabilistic fiber bundle clusters and he did that for short fiber bundles as well as for long fiber bundles. That's why the versions are 2018 long and 2018 short. So deep white matter and, and um, uh, superficial white matter. Um, 
he only provides those in the MNI ICBM 152, and it's also at the microscopic scale again, so one millimeter resolution. Um, I can't say much about the methods that are behind this um, because it's not my project, but I'm happy to provide you with the corresponding uh, information online. Um, and then there's the Big Brain Atlas, so that's in development, and the only areas currently fully mapped by this deep learning algorithm are HOC1 and HOC2, which are um, the correspondences to V1 and V2. Um, and it's, of course, microscopic, and Katrin Amons and Alan Evans are the um, project leads on this. Uh, so as you can see, like the Big Brain and the U-Brain are, of course, highly related, and that's why we also have a short excursion on the U-Brain. Um, so it's, again, just technical facts, the most of them you saw already. Um, the method overview is a bit different from the big brain because we're talking about a probabilistic map. So we have 23 brains, and these are, I can't say now, the age range, but we can check it later online because it's all published already. Um, so we have 23 brains. Um, they are first scanned with an MRI, and then they're embedded in paraffin and also completely and serially cut also in 20 micrometer slices. Um, but then in instead of sli like staining all of them, we only stain, mount and stain every 15th slice. And actually for the analysis, only every 60 or about uh, is taken um, for the delineation of experts. And those are done really manually in sense of these are only done by experts sitting down, taking each brain, taking one area in the brain and then looking at them. And for each area, they actually take 10 brains. They delineate the specific area in the 10 brains. And then later on, the resulting maps are overlaid and then defined as a maximum probability map of the atlas. But the raw data, so the, or the raw data, the probability maps of the overlaid um, individual maps, they are also available. The individual maps are currently not available. Maybe they will be in future, but right now, it's only the probability maps. But of course, if you can see here, these are 10 subjects, and this is V1 and V2. Um, they were uh, delineated in the same 10 brains. Uh, you see already that there is a quite relatively large intersubject variability. So the resulting maps and the resulting atlas kind of take into account these subject intervariability, um, which makes them a bit more robust um, in respect to atlases that only take one brain and look at them that way. Okay, so uh, that's about the U-brains for the usage note, uh, for the technical part, but the usage note, so you have this inspection of inter-subject um, variability and later on you can also have a look at the probability map, so this is the probability map of uh, V1, uh, and V1 is called in the U-brain area HOC1 for human occipital area 1, um, um, but it's the correspondence to V1 or Brodmann 17 or the uh, Kekitzulkos. Um, then this, of course, provides us with a relative reliable cytoarchitectonic brain atlas, and these maximum p-maps um, um, are also available online and currently, so in the version 18, we have 106 areas defined. Most of them are cortical and we have a few subcortical ones at the moment. Um, there are, let me lie, I would say around 30 currently in the making, uh, so 30 more areas and um, so at the end of the project and then maybe 20 more at the beginning. So um, it's a continuous development. Every time there are some new areas out there, they are published first as probability maps and then secondly integrated into the atlas as the maximum probability map and then there is a new atlas release. Um, so these parcels, of course, allow us to anchor other data to them because they're in a common space and pe people that provide data in the common space, we can actually then attach them either semantically or really by coordinate-based um, spatial anchoring. So the receptor density measurements you can also find online already. Um, and those receptor density measurements are only semantically linked. 
because they don't have raw data, or they have raw data, but they don't give us the spatial coordinates of them. They are not anchored yet. That might come in future, but right now it's only a semantical link. And they are based on autoradiography um, measurements, and this is the one from the muscarinic 3 uh, receptor in HOC1. And you see here the, the distribution of it in one sample of the data. So it's really a, an example autoradiography snippet. Um, what they usually do is that they provide fingerprints of one receptor, so an average, average density of one receptor with the standard deviation, I think based on five samples, five different uh, humans. Um, but these are metadata that you can also find in our database. So let's get back to the atlases. So what is an interactive atlas viewer? So usually we are not saying we are providing atlases, but we are providing interactive atlases at the HPP. And this is exactly getting back to this last point. So we are not only providing an atlas, which is based on one data set, we are providing that, and then try to integrate as many data as we can into the same atlas connected to the terminology or to the space. Um, we do that because we cannot study everything in one brain, um, but we, if we do want to do neuroscience and uh, like relate different parts of the brain, we really need to integrate those data coming from different labs, and that's the effort we do in HPP. But that's, of course, uh, a process that takes time um, and also needs a bit of um, yeah, preparation from the data uh, provision part. So the interactive part, as I said, before, so we have our templates at the macroscopic scale and at a microscopic scale, and we have um, the macroscopic scaled atlases and the microscopic scaled atlases. So in the microscopic template, we can, of course, do high resolution connect, we could integrate high resolution uh, connectivity data. We can um, connect cell distributions. These are actually currently measured within the big brain based on these 3D cell reconstruction, so really actually density measurements within the big brain. Then we have these receptor density distributions, which in principle, principle could be anchored to, uh, to microscopic scales. We're currently working on single cell models, which are like they're um, a data set that came in which have 3D cell reconstructions and they actually have them stained in larger brain images, so we can actually anchor them to the big brain, which would be interesting because then you see the, where the cell might lie in the big brain from its reconstructed part. Um, and then high resoluted maps, which are of course currently the big brain ones. So in principle, so I showed you three atlases, right, that are currently supported. We're working on a fourth one, that's the AAL. Um, to be integrated into the, um, uh, I think it's the MNI 152. But there are a bunch of atlases out there, and if people are interested that provide these atlases that they want to be supported by HPP, they can approach us and we can then evaluate if we can integrate the data. It's not a matter of if we want to, it's more a matter of if we have the manpower to. Um, but that's uh, a possibility and also something we would like to tackle in future a bit more. And then on the macroscopic scale, we have low connectivity um, data, we have functional imaging data, we have low resolution maps, and then there are these combined things. We get a lot of stereotactic EEG data, um, and EEG data, and TMS data, and all of them in principle could also be linked to atlas structures based on coordinates if they provide them. Um, but I didn't mention them here because they are need to be displayed differently, right? So, I mean, they are electrophysiology um, data, so uh, time, time series, and uh, we are currently working on a lot of integrations with different software so that you can actually switch from the atlas from a coordinate point that marks an electrode contact to a software that can display this time series that is connected to that coordinate point. So that's something that's in the making and nearly done, but not yet ready to show. Um, so behind the scenes, as I mentioned already a lot, we are doing more than just showing nice images. So we do a lot of meta and data curation, metadata and data curation. Um, and there is the big thing, which is the knowledge graph, so the KG 
you, you might hear that uh, abbreviation a lot in HPP, um, which are the important parts. So that's the database, and that's more or less us, so me and roughly 20 people um, that are yeah, looking through the data, looking at the metadata, trying to standardize them, and then integrate them into the database. Um, so I can highly recommend the talk from Oliver Schmidt today. Um, he is going to talk a lot about the technological part behind that, I guess. Um, so if you provide data, you could ask for if you can be curated, so if we could uh, help you in doing so. If we accept, and that's mainly uh, to the point, like if we have enough manpower and if your data are already organized, because um, the better they are organized and standardized from your side, the less we have to do. So if you come with a, for example, BIDS conform data set, we are very, very happy um, and would immediately say yes <laughs> to your data. Um, then these data are usually, so if you want to publish via the HPP, so get a DOI for your data set, then we are um, having the rule that you have to store your data on the HPP data storage, so it's a, a high performance computing storage from the CSCS in uh, Switzerland. Um, those is where the data are lying, and then uh, we take metadata out of them and link them according to the data here into our database. And then the Atlas viewer, so the team around Timo Dickscheid actually, looks at these metadata description, looks at the data, and then thinks about how are they spatially anchored, or how could they be spatially anchored into the Atlas Viewer, how can we make connections, and then integrate them stepwise. So you can imagine that depending on the heterogeneity of neuroscience formats and structures of repositories and data structures within files, that's kind of a very hard job, and currently is a lot of manual work. Um, we are really looking forward to the point where we can more get more BIDS data, where we can use like standardized routines, at least on those, in order to be able to visualize them. Um, but the current way or the current reason why there are so little data visible in, in, in the Atlas viewer compared to how many data sets we have in the, in the knowledge graph is exactly that, because we have to manually process them and you have to integrate them and check with the quality. You have to check back with the exper experts on the data to make sure that you didn't make an, a mistake. That takes a bit of time. But if it is in place, you can then do data queries based on semantically uh, search parts. So, I mean, we have a search engine, the, the uh, KG search UI, which we can have a look later, um, that links to the, um, to the database. Um, and then we have, you can do data queries as well in the Atlas viewer. I mean, you will see later also based on semantically parts, but more or less by visually exploring them. So you're starting with the brain area, you will be shown that there are related data sets to it, then you can have a preview of them, go back to the knowledge graph if you want to have more information and so on. So that's the whole pipeline that is behind the HPP atlases, um, the interactive atlases. Um, so now we are kind of closing the talk part. I can still continue talking because I can always talk, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I would like to do this part a bit more interactively. So I show you some stuff and you can tr try it out and then interrupt me, ask questions, maybe figure some things out. I, I only show a peek of what you can do with the atlases. So that's the, um, that's the uh, best way to get to the atlases. So if you type in eBrains and then go to view, <laughs> I think, <laughs> is the current way. Um, let me know if, you're, if you get stuck or if you immediately find it. Yeah, so you can take, uh, ah, yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, so mentioning just um, besides the human atlases, we also have one for uh, uh, rats and one for um, mice, a uh, mouse. So it's the Ellen mouse we have integrated and we have the wax home for the rats. You can also find them on the same page, but um, it's the human brain atlases today, so I'm sticking to the humans. Are you there, or all of you? Okay. 
Um, so as I mean, some of you might be very familiar with Atlas views, but uh, just to let you know, so there's a four window mode. So we have the front view of the brain, we have the side view, we have the top view, and then there is a 3D whole brain. If you wanna figure out how to display it like this, then you need to toggle the, this octant. It's, it's usually placed somewhere within that, uh, within that field, and if you toggle it, then you see the surface usually of the brain. Um, so <clears throat> select a template, an atlas, and a region. So you can do this at the upper left corner of the atlas viewers. There, there is this field. You can either hide this one uh, via this button or unlink it. And then you can select the template, so the, the brain template in the upper part, then the parcellations, which, is, which are the available atlases in the lower part. And then you can search for a region. Um, you can also click this part and then you see an hierarchical um, organization of the, of the regions. I guess that works for everyone, right? You don't have to select my selection. You can do whatever you want to. Talk to me. Is it fine? <laughs> okay. If I'm, yeah? Can you say a little bit more about the hierarchical organization? How does that work? The last option? Ah. So in principle, so if you click it, then you see this hierarchical, um, so you, there is a window popping up in the middle. Yes. Then you see the, the data, which are, or the areas which are connected to the U-brain as a hierarchy. And in principle, you can also just screen through that and then click on one and you select it as well. So you don't have to search for it by knowing the name, but you can just visually inspect it. Um, and right now that is hard coded, but in the long run, um, we actually will connect that to ontology. So for the supported atlases, we will register. Does anybody know what an ontology is? I always have to, okay. So an ontology expert would say that's the right answer. It's like, no, I have no idea what an ontology is. But, <laughs> but uh, so the easiest explanation is you usually start with vocabulary, right? So you define something and give it a name. Oh, you, you give it a name. The second step is you define a terminology, which actually means that you give the name a definition, right? And an ontology takes all of that and all the terms or terminologies out there and then makes relations between them. So, for example, we had a nice, a nice uh, thing with the areas, right? So I said area HOC1, and then I said it's V1, and then it's 17, right, for Brotman. So these are all different names, and they all have a similar definition, which is based on the, court, like the location of that area, and an ontology is making the relations between them and saying, okay, all these three terms are actually related because they are reflecting the same anatomical structure or a similar anatomical structure. And this is what an ontology is doing, and it's doing that not only for brain areas, but in general. So there's uh, very nice uh, confusions also between terms uh, in neuroscience or in the world generally. So best case, if I would say, what is for you a data set? I'm pretty sure we come up with three different definitions here. Um, um, so the, the good thing is that um, the ontology combines all of those and allows them to cross-query uh, beyond the expert knowledge. So that's the ontology, a rough ontology uh, explanation. Um, yeah, and these, uh, these, this uh, hierarchy uh, in future will be connected to an ontology, which then would also allow to jump across different hierarchies, right? So if you are selected HOC 1 and 1 and you would like to switch to the red atlas, currently there is no connection between the V1 of the red atlas and our HOC 1, but an ontology could make that link and make it actually explicit by explaining that's the red, that's the human, so it's not the same, but we are talking about a related thing. Okay. Um, so then actually when you select one, so if you type in some area here, so I typed in uh, HOC1 because it's a nice example, um, you can actually select those. And um, 
to jump in here, so you see it's, it's not a nice color because they are always pale, but you see that here a maximum probability map of both hemispheres is selected and I actually jumped into that. And this jumping too you can do via this button. If you click on it, then uh, you will, the, the viewer actually jumps to the centroid of that region you selected. So you can test that. And please let me know if something is not working because then I have to report back. <laughs> Yeah? Sorry, can you repeat that? Ah, yeah, brainstem is not part of the U brain yet, so you won't find them. <laughs> I'm very sorry. But you can, like, on the micro, so if you're interested in the microscopic uh, view of it, like without a region attached to it, but then you could go to the big brain and navigate to your region of interest by yourself. Um, so, and you can just switch to the big brain up here, right? So you can immediately switch back and forth. Um, so the second part is then you can actually explore that there are related data sets connected to the regions you selected. So in HOC1, we have a bunch of data sets selected here. And um, you can filter for them. There are certain filter um, keywords in place. So I, for example, here now press the filter button, then I selected auto radiography. And if I did that, I can then see that it ends up with exactly one data set attached to it. I can click on it, I get the metadata description. So the actually it's not only the metadata description, it's the corresponding landing page that is with, connected to the knowledge graph. And um, here I can press the preview button, for example, and then I get a list of images that are connected to that preview, and if I click on them, I can visualize them. So I can have this image, for example, selected if I click on the NMDA uh, preview. Um, so I already mentioned connection to knowledge graph, and of course you can also click on the explore button, and then you end up uh, so uh, there should be a page opening, uh, um, a tab opening, which leads you to the landing page of this exact data set that is registered in the knowledge graph. And there you can find more information. So you can find um, the custodians, which are um, Carl Silas at the moment and Palomero Galaga, uh, um, that are the leading parts in it. You can find that there is actually a project related to it, so there might be more data that are dealing with den density measurements of receptors. Um, you can click through this. You can see also the subjects, like what age they have, and so on a bit below uh, on the landing page. And this is how this is connected. So uh, play around with it. Try to find things. Um, let me know if you stumble into issues. As a summary, so as I said before, it's not my work, not at all. So only the ontology and metadata part is my thing. But um, there are a lot of people connected to this over the world. So um, brain architecture, as I mentioned, is um, Jean-Francois or Jeff Majin uh, and his group. There's also Bertrand Thirion, who is delivering, so I didn't show any data from him, but he is uh, delivering uh, a lot of fMRI data for, for um, the HPP. Then there's Francesco Pavone, who is doing uh, cell reconstructions. Rainer Goebel, who is doing a lot of human data in general, uh, varying from fMRI, um, uh, high resoluted fMRIs for, uh, especially. Then we have the HPP Neuroinformatics. As I mentioned, Oliver Schmidt will be there this afternoon, so you can have a look at his talk. And um, there's Jan Bialy, who is the head of the curation uh, of SP5, so of the Neuroinformatics platform within HPP, who is sitting in Oslo, and we have a huge curation team over there as well. Um, Jan Le Prince is sitting with Jeff Majin and doing a lot of uh, spatial integration for imaging data. We have a bunch of people developing the big brain at the Magill University, then um, the supercomputing center in Jülich has also parts, uh, then us, the data analytics parts, uh, so there, there's me and there is a bunch of other people here. Um, and then the brain mapping, who are doing the U brain and the big brain mapping. Um, and these are also not all people, so if you want to have like the actual contributors to each data set, you should have a look at the data set cards. They are mentioned there. Um, check out 
our hashtag thingies. Um, I'm not so into social media, but uh, yeah. So I wanted to show as a final thing an old video, so it's the old view of the Atlas viewer, so don't be too serious about it, but it's summing up quite nicely what I showed you. And I would say we made a bit good the time, I think we're at 40 minutes now, but um, if you want to check out a bit more the Atlas viewer or have some, have some questions, we can do that now. And you can watch the video in parallel. <laughs> Thank you.